So why don't we start with, I want to talk before we start talking about the book itself, I want to take a second to talk about book club. Um, so basically, this book club hasn't ended up playing out the way I'd hoped it would. First off, I was hoping we'd get a much bigger audience of people who wanted to keep coming back and participating again and again. Um, I also thought a lot more people would want to participate with the ideas of the books. And the last few meetings, it seems like half the people that show up didn't even read the book. They're just showing up to like get a review <laughs> as part of the book club. So I've given it a lot of thought and I've basically realized there's a much better way to do what I'm trying to do here. So we won't do December. It's Christmas anyway. We won't worry about it. And we'll take some time to kind of think it through. If anyone in this group or anyone who watches this video on the YouTube channel later wants to take over the role that I'm currently, you know, hosting here by like doing the work to prepare every week, a little presentation to talk about the book and stuff, I'd be happy to hand over the book club to you guys. And I'll still run the website and the email and stuff like that if you need. So that option is out there. If anybody wants to take over the hosting role, reach out to me at Ahoy at Pirate Traders. Let me know. I'd be happy to work out with you keeping this format going, um, but somebody else being responsible for it, basically. Without further ado, let me dive right in. So I wanted to start by just reading a quick uh, little excerpt here that I think kind of sums things up pretty well. It says, traders often assume that their mistakes, especially mental and emotional ones, should be easy to fix. You know what the mistake is, so you don't do it anymore, right? Seems like a simple enough strategy. But in the heat of the moment, it's not that simple. Mistakes continue to happen, and you either get pissed off, feel pressure, lose confidence, lose motivation, become distracted as a form of denial, blame something random, make excuses, or any combination of the above. You know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, yet you tenaciously believe the problem should be fixed easily and still don't work on it. Plus. Since now you're more aware of it, you think there's no way it'll happen to me again. And then it does show up, maybe not for a few days or a week or even a month, giving you a false sense of confidence. But eventually the mistake happens again. Your emotional reaction is even stronger this time. One of the key takeaways from this book for me is that every single um, psychology book that you'll read about trading often tells you that emotions are to be avoided, right? When you recognize a certain emotion, the thing to do, the right move for you to make as a trader is to find a way to avoid that emotion. So for example, let's say uh, you get into a trade, you lose some money, you get really angry, you start revenge trading, you're losing more money, you recognize the problem. Oh no, I'm angry, I'm revenge trading. What's the solution? Walk away from the market, right? Go for a walk, go to the gym, uh, you know, make something to eat or whatever, right? Just walk away from the market a little bit. Let those emotions go away, you know, slowly work themselves out of your system. And then you can come back to the charts fresh and approach them again. And I will say for me personally, that is an incredibly effective strategy. It's incredibly effective to when you recognize an emotion, take an action to deal with the emotion and to make that part of your trading strategy, that part of the rules you use to follow are rules that force you to deal with the emotions as they come up. But what Jared does such a great job of is explaining that doing that, while it's fine, he fully suggests you do that, right? If you're upset, if you're full of rage in that moment, walk away from the market, free yourself up. But you can't fix the problem that way. You can solve it temporarily and come back fresh and not deal with it again. But whatever was the underlying issue is going to keep coming up. And then you'll be pissed off again tomorrow and you'll have to take another break and you'll be pissed off two weeks later and you'll have to take another break and da 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 So what he says is, instead of trying to avoid emotions, instead of seeing your emotions as a thing that is to be avoided, you instead see your emotions as a thing to give you signals as to what's going on, 
what's going on with your psychology and what's going on with your strategy in that particular moment. And if you're doing that, if when you feel the emotion, you are looking at it almost like a, um, like a scientist who's studying data and is, and is, you know, marking off what that data means and what it will lead to and da, 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 da. If, if you're looking at your emotions that way, there is no need to avoid them, right? You don't need to walk away completely and avoid the market because you learn how you got there in the first place. So that's the other thing that he talks about that I thought was just really, really important. He talks about the fact that these things don't happen instantly. It's not like you're sitting there trading and you've got a cool, calm, collected mind and everything is great. And then one trade goes against you and suddenly you're angry and you're revenge trading and your emotions are out of control. But that's what we all think. We all think it's like, oh, boom, I'm angry now. But that's not actually how it plays out. In the real world, it starts small and it builds. And, and smaller emotions are the first signals that the bigger emotions are coming. So let's take that scenario. Let's say you, you see a setup in the market that you think is a good trade. And so you put your order in, you put your stop loss, you put your take profit. Everything is perfect. You follow all your rules. It's a great setup. It looks gorgeous. You get in the trade and then boom, you get stopped out, right? The trade doesn't, doesn't work in your favor. Naturally, you're not going to get upset, right? You are a trader. You recognize that losing trades is part of the game. Sometimes you can do everything right and it still doesn't work. So you're not really going to get angry at that one loss, but you might get a little bit annoyed, right? You might just be like, oh, fuck you market. Like I did everything right. And, and, and you might not really be upset, but you're just a little bit ticked off, just a little bit annoyed. And so then what happens is your brain recognizes that that frustration is going on. Your subconscious recognizes that you're getting annoyed with the market. So then what it's going to do is it's going to try to settle that emotion by comforting you and convincing you, don't worry, you know what the market is doing. You've got an understanding. Your bias is right. Everything is okay. Trust your system. Trust your setups. Get in another trade. So then you're going to get in a trade. And this time, the market's going to go against you and stop you out. And then you're going to just flip out in a rage. Okay. And you're just going to be angry. And then you're going to start revenge trading and da, 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 da. Right. We know the process. But if you can learn to catch the emotion when it's just that subtle little bit of annoyance and find a way to re-jigger your approach, change your thinking, um, and, and re-strategize, then you can prevent it from becoming the anger that leads to the revenge trading, that leads to the problems down the line. One concept that he talked about in this book that I also just deeply, deeply connected with, and I've never heard anyone bring this up before, and it, it brought me such peace um, understanding it, is that sometimes when you're on the road to correcting a problem, you can actually overcorrect and create a new problem. And this is something that I do all the time. So I'll start with a problem like um, lack of confidence, right? Like I don't have the confidence to get in a trade. So I'll slowly but surely start coming up with strategies to help me feel more confident. I can do this, I can do that, blah, blah, blah. And then I start to get better and better. And then my confidence builds and builds and builds. And eventually I get to a point where I start taking unnecessary risk. I start like doing stupid things and being overly confident. And then I have to like relearn not to be overly confident and to, and to pull myself back again. And that is another concept that I've never heard anyone talk about that I really found enlightening in this book was the idea that it's a constant journey. You're going to be working on one thing and get better and better at it. And then that's going to open a door to a whole new freaking problem that now you got to go down that alleyway and deal with that problem and work it all out. And then as soon as you get through that door, ah, fuck, well, now there's this other thing. And so when you accept that the, the process of being a trader is the process of constant self-analysis and self-development, you actually begin to become excited about these emotions. You, you, you begin to become excited because they are opportunities 
for you to learn and develop and adjust and get better and better and better. And as you do that more often and it works out, you'll become more, more confident with it. The first thing I wanted to mention that he talked about here that I thought was just absolutely brilliant and it's a really important thing to consider uh, is what he calls A game, B game, and C game, okay? And the, the thing that differentiates these things that you need to understand is these are not setups. He's not talking about an A game is where the, the market generated information is beautifully set up and you're in a perfect trade in terms of you know, you waited for the good entry, you got the good, blah, blah, blah. That's not a game. What he's talking about is psychologically. What he's talking about is how you feel and how you function in finding the trade and in getting in the trade and playing it out to the end, right? There's, there's different categories psychologically that you could place yourself into. A game being the best when you can, um, when the only thing that's going to take you out is an unavoidable mistake, right? This is something like I just talked about. Sometimes you're going to get in a trade, you're going to do everything right, and the market's just going to go against you anyway. And that's just, that is what it is. But you didn't do anything wrong. You weren't out of control. You were patient. You had a good entry. Everything was fine. And then you've got the level where it's like, it's a blend of weaknesses in your um, decision-making and mental or emotional flaws. So now it's like, okay, well, this trade didn't work out because I made some mistakes, right? I Maybe this is that scenario where the previous trade, it didn't work out and I let myself get annoyed and then I carried that annoyance on. And so this is like, you know, I can do better, but I'm not out of control here. And then the C game scenarios, that's where it's like, you're completely out of control. These are the ones where you feel like an alien took over your body. You don't even understand how you just got in that trade. How the hell did I just make that mistake again? Jesus, Charles, you've done this a million times, you know, not to do that. Why'd you just do it again? Right. That's the C game. That's when your, your psychology is working against you so much that you're out of control. You can't even make good decisions. Okay. So let's just take a quick second here and we'll look at, uh, look at what those, how we define those things a little bit here. Okay. So examples, uh, in terms of the mental game for when you're in that a game zone, you're very relaxed, you're decisive, you're patient, you're confident, and you're trusting your gut in that B game. You're overthinking your attention is on the wrong types of markets or the wrong focus. You're losing focus. You're not able to stay focused on the market. You're missing obvious traits. There are setups that you could be taking and you're missing them. You're constantly watching your P&L. Um, you're reacting very slowly. You're not you know, focused and in it. You're kind of just lazily participating. Or you're going against your gut. You're, the, your gut is telling you to go long, but you don't trust it. And you're going short because you want to go against yourself. Okay. That's when you're in that B zone right there. And then C game distracted, risk averse, force, excuse me, forcing trades, no patience, negative self-talk, self-doubt, um, again, trading your PL, right? Worried more about the money you're making and losing and not the quality of your setups. RK raised his hand. I don't know what that means. Just, I just wonder if you could zoom in a little bit, Charles, if that's possible. Maybe it's oh. my old eyes. Um, I also have a ginormous screen. That's part of the problem too. Um, okay. So then. So these are some tactical skills and how they would play out, you know, in these different scenarios. So a game, clear understanding of the context of the market, clear understandings of solutions, clear understanding of locations, where to enter, where to put your stop, where to take profits. You know, you're letting the price come to you. This is what Jim Dalton will call letting the trade come to you, not forcing entries. Um, and you can also see where everyone else is getting trapped, right? This is when you're in that a game zone, you can suddenly recognize uh, where other people are are making mistakes. And uh, it's very obvious to you where it's not obvious to them. So the B game, that's the um, worst understanding of the context, the correlation, the location. Uh, you're scalping for just a few ticks because you're too scared to get into a real trade to make some real money. Um, you're not aware enough to sit 
um, to sit out opportunities. You're just trying to get into every trade. You're cutting trades too soon, right? You're moving your stop before your trade has a chance to really get to where it's going. Um, you're paying too much attention and there's no good read uh, in, in the volatility, right? These are all actual literal things that will play out. And then of course you got your C game, the dreaded C game, where you're talking about, you keep chasing the trades, you're chasing price, you're trying to force it. You keep fading the directional moves. Uh, you keep cutting trades too soon. I have a feeling some of you today were trying to short, weren't you? You don't have to say anything, but I know you're out there, right? Uh, cutting trades too soon because you didn't get paid fast enough, didn't follow your your rules about how much risk you're willing to take, making impulsive trades, over trading, um, scaling without planning to scale, right? That's like where you get in, the market goes against you and you go like, mm, I'll add to it. Like, uh, no, if you didn't plan to add to it there before you got in, that's not a good trade setup. So this is where things get really interesting. This is something I've never heard before, but it makes complete and total sense. And I absolutely loved it. He uses the analogy, okay, of a bell-shaped curve. And he says that you're going to spend the least amount of time in those A game scenarios, right? The number of trades that you take as a trader, um, you know, the, the percentage of them, that will be those really great, you're perfectly in the zone trades is only going to be a small portion of the trades that you take. The largest portion are going to be the ones where you're kind of half in, half out, where you've got some control. You're not out of control, but the, your emotions, your psychology is still having an effect. And then a similar portion to the amount that you're going to be completely in control, you're also going to be completely out of control. Okay. But here's where it gets interesting. This is what's cool. It's what he calls the inchworm effect. What you can do, obviously the whole strategy of this book is working on each one of the problems that lead to these scenarios. And so as you work on each one of those problems, you move like an inchworm moves, right? So how does an inchworm move? Well, it starts flat, then it pulls its back end forward and curls up like this, okay? Then it pushes its front end forward and goes flat again. And then it pulls its back end forward and then it curls up again, okay? So think about that's how it moves in the process of getting where it's going. This is exactly how the process of developing your psychology as a trader also moves. You, you work one end of the spectrum and the other separate from one another. And as you work on them, they will move the dial. So you'll start working on some of your B game problems that you have. Okay. You'll start, actually, sorry, let me, let me take that back. <laughs> Starting over. So you'll start with working on your C game problems. Okay. You're working on the things that, that cause you the most frustration, the most difficulty, okay? The things that make you the most upset. And you slowly but surely start to get better at those things. And so then what you're doing as you do that is you're starting to pull the tail end this direction. You're starting to cause that curve to build, okay? And slowly but surely, the elements of your trading, which are negatively affecting you, affects you less and less, okay? But then at the same time, your B-level problems, the psychological effects that are hurting you on your B-level, as you are getting better and better at those, you're pushing the center forward and there, you're having less and less of those problems. They're becoming A-game. So that's the body's flattening itself back out. And this is the theory that I was just talking about, about how as you start to fix one problem, you discover whole new problems and whole new problems and whole new problems. What you don't realize is it feels like you're taking five steps forward and three steps back. But really all you're doing is you're just pulling your back end. You're pulling your weaknesses closer to strengths. You're taking your middle line weaknesses, making them stronger. And then in so doing, increasing the amount of strengths that you have. So you're improving very, very slowly 
one little tug at a time. And this takes years to do. This is not something you do overnight. You don't read a book. You don't listen to a podcast. You don't instantly change like this. Slowly but surely, the same speed that an inchworm moves, you bring your development forward and forward over time. Okay. That's the nature of uh, essentially what he's teaching here and what I thought was, was really, really pivotal. Now, if you didn't read the book, you have to read the book. Okay. What he does is he lays out very specific examples of all the areas in life that are, sorry, all the aspects of trading that can lead to those problems that can get you those B and C game scenarios. And he does a great job of differentiating them. So it's not just um, gr greed and fear, it's tilt, it's focus, it's a lot of other things that when you separate them out, you realize they all inter affect one another. You might think you made this bad trade just because you got greedy, but maybe you got greedy and you weren't focused, right? For a totally separate other psychological reason. And so don't work on the, the thing about the greed, work on the other one and so on and so forth. So you've got to read the book. You've got to go through chapter by chapter by chapter, listen to every example that he explains and look for the ones that relate to you and then track the systems that he gives for things that you can do, um, you know, in order to make improvements on those specific problems that you're having. Okay, so I sent the link in the email um, for anyone uh, who didn't get it. I'll post it here in the chat in a second, um, which basically is where all of his worksheets that he made up are. And you can literally go through these worksheets one by one and you can, and this is not something you do again. This isn't something you do like tonight. Like you just sit down and do this once and you're done. Over the next few months, you're adding and adding and adding to this. As you're learning more about yourself and you're thinking about these things more, you're adding more and more context, okay? What gives me anger? What are the things that lead to it? What changes can I make that help me adapt to it? And then you got the same thing for like um, confidence, discipline, fear, greed, all of them. You know, this is the way that you, uh, you correct those things. Also in there is this data collection worksheet, which is just a way to very simply track these things intraday, okay? This seems insane, doesn't it? Like, wait a second. So you're telling me every time I get in a trade that isn't A game, that's B game or C game trade, I got to sit here, I got to write out the instrument and the situation. So what am I trading and why? I got to write the trigger that got me into it. What were the thoughts? What were the emotions? What were my behaviors? What were my agit? Um, actions, what were the changes in my decisions, you know, changes in the market perception, blah, blah, blah. I got to sit and write this out for every trade. This is too much. This is the way. This is what he talked about it when, in that piece that I just read, where he said, if you think just understanding this stuff is going to make it automatically get fixed, it's not. You must put pen to paper. You must do the homework. Even if you never, ever go back and look at this piece of paper again, just the act of writing it out, of forcing yourself to truly analyze your thoughts, your behaviors, that is how you will correct them. Just being aware that you have problems won't do it. So anyway, I'll post that link and I highly recommend everybody uh, start actually working these things out on a regular basis. Um, and then just one more time, I'll just walk you through quickly how this works. So first you map out the pattern, you track the problems that you have, you identify the root, right? Where does it start? It always starts with something small, and then you come up with the strategy to deal with it in real time. And if you just keep doing this one problem at a time, you will slowly inchworm your way to being a better and better trader. And with that, I will open it up to an open table conversation. I liked what he said about um, the difference between fear and anger. That um, fear, you're still aware of, a lot more aware of the whole board and the whole game. It just makes you more reticent to take trades or, and the usual things, cutting them short and all of that. 
Anger, on the other hand, just blanks you out. You're not analyzing at all, uh, and pretty quickly. And so um, the mis I think that the mistakes made in anger uh, can be a lot more costly than the mistakes made in fear. That's very interesting. And I wonder if other people would feel the same or maybe even feel the inverse, right? That maybe when they're in anger, it's it's a different experience than fear. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Being able to differentiate the subtleties in the two is very powerful. Um, anger isn't an, an emotion. It's an end result. So it's an outlet for that emotion. So it's not actually the core emotion. There's no such emotion as anger. We might think there is, but you need to work out what triggered you to that point to become angry. So I think that's maybe why he relisted it as tilt rather than anger. So. <clears throat> totally. Well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, fear, can you can see anger as a cover for fear often. Yes. Yeah, that's one. One, one of the things it could be yeah fear it could be um jealousy it could be um yeah fear is one in trading I guess FOMO is what we talk about isn't it so I think the the, the good thing with the book is that um, when you have been trading a bit and um struggling a bit I guess because I'm not making money so obviously I'm not quite where I want to be yet um it's nice to. I think this book is was written in 2020, which is just nice that it's a newer version because you know you get a little bit tired of reading books from 1932 where it's kind of all shirt and tie and the old way it used to be. This is kind of <clears throat> feels like it was written for me in some ways, and the, the um, examples it gives are very relevant as such, which I found was very useful. And 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 it's nice to know you're not alone, like you're like not an idiot because you make these mistakes or you do these things. So. Um, I think that was something that was really valuable about the book. Um, yeah, just being a more modern take on things um, about the mental side of it, which is really the main part, really. So. Um, I really like the book too, Ben. Um, I appreciate it, Pirate, that you brought this book. It hit me at the right time too. Um, I have chronic pain issues with the lower back surgery and stuff, and been dealing with it for a long time and I finally went to see a psychologist and he handed me a book that's pretty much the same thing about dealing with the emotions of pain as opposed to trying to get rid of it and trying to uh, stop them and that's one of the things I took away from this book too is that he doesn't really stop the emotions he uh, um, he he tries to mitigate their manifestation by eliminating the actions that would trigger them but he doesn't actually go out and say no you're not going to get angry he still admits that you're going to have bad days and you're going to have anger and you're going to have frustration and you're going to have a uh, anxiety and fear that manifest from trading because there's a tremendous amount of our work environment <clears throat> is uncontrollable by us in that you know, you're going to get blindsided left and right. And look at Powell today. Who who the hell thought that was going to happen? I mean, that that was, I'm, I'm still looking at the 30 minute bars and I just can't believe that that I period was just amazing. And it was stunning. But I also, having read the book, didn't go FOMO on it, didn't jump in on it, and also didn't try to stand in front of it. I, I set up maybe six trades to fade it and looked at them and had them all set up and ready to go. And I was like, wait for the one time framing to finish. It, it's got to, it's got to go. It's got to finish. It's got to go into cessation. It's got to stop this. Otherwise it'll go farther than I can control it. And I didn't, I didn't take any of them, delete them. It was great. And, and I wrote it up in my notes at the end of the day that it was just, a, it was a great feeling seeing that and knowing that, nope, not going to go there. And I got a lot of that from just being with the group and sitting back and watching and listening with the group. And also this book it was really beneficial to me. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear that. That is a, a very pivotal moment for a trader 
when you have that realization, when not acting becomes as rewarding as having gotten into a trade and winning, you know, because that's what matters. Like what happened today, if you looked at that and you're, and you were saying to yourself, I made a mistake because I didn't know this was going to happen ahead of time. You're fucking crazy. No one like, sure. We thought it could bounce up to the opposite end of balance. We thought that first little push could happen, but to keep going and going and going, like there's no way you could have predicted that. So you shouldn't be upset that you didn't know what was going to happen in that scenario. What you should be upset about is how you played it. How did you play the uncertainty of that market? Did you follow your rules? And like you said, if you put in those trades and then before they filled, you knew they weren't right and you got out of them, that's as good as if you were in a fucking winning trade the whole time. Like that's yeah. victory. Yeah, I felt really, really good. The other thing that was hitting me was a joke. My brother told me this weekend that these two people are walking along and one of them looks down and goes, wow, that looks like the light at the end of the tunnel. And he goes, no, no, that's the beginning of the end. That's not the end of the end. That's the beginning of the end. And later on, when the train conductor was being interviewed by the police, he said it just looked like two morons looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at this and I was like, wow, that's the light at the end of the tunnel. Step aside. Just look down. If there's tracks on either side, you're in the wrong spot. Step to the left or right. Yep. All right, can you can you guys hear me? Hello. Yep, go for it. Hey, all right. The biggest takeaway for me from this book um, is the concept of a report card. It's something that I do daily um, after every trade. Or at, at the end of the day, I write my trades down: what worked well, what didn't work well, uh, things to improve on. And it's something that's definitely propelled me forward. And I think I mentioned earlier in the chat group, uh, Charles, the concept of uh, I don't trade the FOMC days past twelve o'clock. Um, or any time the Jerome Powell speaks. It's just historically, I don't have a statistical advantage. I always end up giving my profits back. And I just found that it's just best to just go ahead and step back, let the market do its thing. And then tomorrow I'll end up trading from a more you know, statistical advantage. Yeah, that's huge. That's very big. And and how many times did you say you you had losing days like that were before this? Did you say like forty or something? No, oh, I, I traded over thirty days, and I you know three days were successful, twenty seven were unsuccessful in regards to the FOMC, and then I literally I just printed off every statement and I have it on my wall, and every time I get that little voice in my head that says, "Hey, this time's going to be different," just go ahead and do it. You look at that, you could fade it. I just look at that you know income statement right up that right on my wall, and I just say, "No, you're dumbass. Don't even try this." Mm -hmm. And that's why FOMC days, I will trade up until 12 o'clock and then call it quits and let the magic happen and let everybody else kind of go crazy. Do you still watch the market or do you just walk away for the day? I'll watch the market. Uh, I think it's important to, you know, look at the key nuances. Like, for example, today when the market took off, uh, you know, before the news even came out, uh, that was an important thing that we all picked up on. And uh, it, it showed me that this is all computer generated trading. And just forced everybody else out and just was hunting for stops. So now I ask myself moving forward, what is the you know, advantage uh, or the probability of this continuing higher? Uh, who knows? But I think it's all computer generated trading. So I think that's important to kind of stick through and force yourself to watch the market and just stick with the groove. Yeah, I got to say on that today, that was fucking eye opening. I know I <laughs> talk about these conspiracy theories all the time with the fact that the market is so manipulated, but like. Now that you look at it in hindsight, you can perfectly see they spent the last two days accumulating a long position <laughs> and the, they just, they had already planned it that exactly at, you know, the strike of one thirty, they were going to pump the market 10 points higher and never let it down again. And that's exactly what they did. The man wasn't even on the stage yet. <laughs> like if you can't recognize that it's all bullshit from that, I don't know what to say. Uh, well, well, the news article I, I posted in the group, I think the news article itself, where they said that they were not going to raise inter, you know, interest rates by uh, three quarters of a point, only a uh, uh, half a point. And I was like, Jerome Powell even said it, has never even spoken to that yet. How, how did they get determined? And 
news. But uh, I agree with you. I think it's heavily manipulated, and uh, we just got to learn to trade with the computers. Yeah. I think it's also been a lot with the screen time is in the past, you just would look at the candles like uh, Malcolm mentioned before, and you could get angry or annoyed or um, greedy because you missed it, you know? Like I look, you know, you wake up, well, for me, I'm in Australia, so it's different hours, but you know, 150 point move, you can, you're salivating, you know, to think what you could have made out of that. It looks so easy in hindsight. <laughs> So often, over and over, I hear from, from people that are professional traders, so really that 5% that are making money, um, they, they don't trade the news because it, it is just too out of control. And, and I, I made my daily goal points, which is I've set myself at the moment, and, and I missed out on all the rest. But, um, you know, you, you realize that it's going to come back again. And there's going to be more opportunities moving forward. And, and having a little win every day is more important than a home run, you know, once, once a month because it can go against you pretty hard. Um, on the emotion side, it's because I, I do a bit of um, coaching, a bit of life emotion stuff with, well, everyone. But um, the, the relevance is, is more and more obvious of how it correlates to your um, actual life and the trading life, but they're not separate things. So... Um, Last night I had this, um, I, I was just talking to my wife and um, I don't know, she said something to annoy me a bit as I was kind of walking out the door or whatever, which sometimes <laughs> wives do if you have one, you know, that can be annoying at times, but um, or kids. And, um, but it was interesting how it just felt like, so I took my mind off that conversation and I went back to trading because, you know, I was thinking, oh, I've got trades to do, I want to set up or whatever. And I could tell that that emotion had come in and then it was going to set me up to maybe revenge trade a bit or try to do a trade to get a positive feeling from that world of trading you know because I wasn't willing to deal with the problem I was having in my marriage world you know type thing so it's quite interesting to see how those two worlds interact and it wasn't leading me to a good decision as such and and I found also with myself it, it doesn't I was finding the numbing of it could be I could win or lose the trade it didn't really matter it was more just the trade was in motion and it was numbing out other distractions as such. So um, I guess that would be classed as, as C game type activities, but um, uh, yeah, but it's just that um, I think recognizing it is very, I call it coming into your conscious mind. Once it's in your conscious mind, you can deal with it. Um, but yeah, and I just, as I liked the example before about putting reminders on your wall or things just to, to slap yourself around and make sure you don't fall down that path again, because it's easy to do. So. Yeah, that's another thing he talks about in the book is like how it these these shifts in thinking don't have to be complicated. They don't have to be hard. Like something as simple as just focusing on, on a single deep breath. You know, like you can learn to like to just adjust your thinking with just something as simple as that. As long as you recognize, oh wait, I'm getting worked up or whatever, you can then just go you can really you can allow yourself to just like switch that off, like wipe it off the, the, the screen and move on once you know that it's a problem. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah. it does talk, and it can be, it could be initially a, a 30 minute walk, literally shutting the computer down or just leaving and going for a walk. And that's when you're, because you recognize it, you've had two, three losses in a row, you're not trading well, you have to really get away. But as you sharpen your sword or your ax as such and you get better and better, it might be literally a deep breath and that's enough to reset you and come back in. But um, it might be drastic, but you need to kind of start with a drastic action and then slowly bring it back because, um, yeah, it, it's not it's not easy. And um, yeah, so many times I've you had many many like bad runs and it, it gets ugly and it, and it's harder to dig yourself out that hole when, when you when you dig yourself into it. So. Yeah, yeah. That also brings to mind you know what he talked about in um, it, it reminds me of uh, what's that book called. Um, micro habits, tiny habits, mini atomic habits. habits, atomic habits. Yeah. It's like that if you want to make real change in your life and, and he brings it up in this book too, is it's got to be small, incremental, tiny little adjustments over a longer period of time. That's how you get where you're going. Yeah. And that, that, that from the atomic habits, yeah, if you do a thousand push-ups in a day, you're not all, all of a sudden buff, but um, 
you do uh, yeah 100 push-ups a day yeah, you, if you start with one push up a day and then two and then ten yeah it's like you can get to a thousand yeah but um but yeah it's um, i think in terms of um psychology um because a lot of this game is totally psychological if not all of it at least as far as we're concerned because we don't have giant computers on fast connections controlling the world um it's psychological and and somewhere i read that um beliefs beliefs are what creates emotions so thoughts create emotion what you believe is is really the trigger so you get a sensory trigger but then the it goes through the the filter of belief and belief is what creates the emotion so if you believe that a loss means you're lesser than or your failure what all those little things that trigger us right to interfere and greed um then you start feeling the emotion and then i read i read something or heard it somewhere a couple of months back and it really stuck with me that beliefs uh, are made of decisions and so speaking to this thing you said charles about small changes we can we can change our beliefs through making small decisions so no that doesn't mean that doesn't reflect on my self-esteem that i made a mistake it's not that i'm a bad person or or, or people will think less of me or uh, you know all that stuff that we get caught up in psychologically when we make mistakes or we lose because it's 50 50 you're going to lose a lot in this game and you don't control anything <laughs> so it's it's a really unique set of circumstances that i think most people's psychology just aren't prepared to even comprehend or process or or adapt to and i think it requires a lot of decisions we make decisions about oh and it's learning too like this means that this means that this doesn't mean that right and it's those little adjustments over time um like ben was saying about uh screen time it's screen time it's learning it's just doing the thing also um moves us along it helps to have a good teacher like uh you too charles i really appreciate uh your commentary i've learned a lot from you man i really appreciate it thank you chirp i appreciate you also, I would just say you should consider getting into ASMR videos. You have a very soothing voice. People have said that before. I should have a, a podcast or something. <laughs> yeah, you really do. I like it. Listening to it in the headphones, it sounds good. Yeah, I agree. I'd, I'd vote for that too. Sean has a great voice. I disagree with one thing though, Sean. We do have one thing in our control, and I think this book really points to it, and that is... Um, really focusing on our procedure for getting into a trade that's the only place that i feel that we have control after that it's like baseball the only thing you can choose to do is swing at a pitch um unlike baseball there's no strikes there's no balls you can stand up there as long as you want but if you swing and hit something there's nothing we can do after that it's it's up to the will of the market and all we can do is put the put the speed of the grass, the the uh, tiredness of the outfield in our advantage by getting a really good pitch, and only swinging of those really good pitches. Yeah, and just like point. baseball, uh, trading is it, it, it's a long ass season. Yeah, there's, a game, there's a game tomorrow, and the guys yeah. who screw up less play yeah. in the postseason. Yeah, suck less. Yeah. Yeah, suck less. I love that term. Suck yeah. less. Yeah. Great, right? Yeah. yeah, there's one baseball quote I use is do simple better. So do simple better and suck less. I think those are two stickers on the monitor tomorrow. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> yeah, I love when when you can simplify a complex concept into something like that. It yeah. really that it really is all it is. Just every day try to suck less. You know, I love that. <laughs> I think um, like on on that, I guess the 
especially with, with children, but it, just myself is, I was brought up before by someone, I can't remember who it was, but um, yes, you can do all your work to, to, to place your trade, but then if it doesn't meet your expectations, you can, you can become frustrated and frustration is unmet expectations is all it is. So um, if your expectations drop as in I'm, I'm giving this trade to the market and I will let it <laughs> determine what happens and, and learn from that either way, you know, and um, cause I can tell, you know, I think that's very powerful to release because I know if I made a hundred points today, um, a few months ago, I would have been, you know, walking around like a, a, a big shot, you know, or something for maybe I'll do a Instagram post on it or something. I probably wouldn't, but um, what I'm trying to say is, but I was just lucky, really. Like there was no skill in that. Like there was skill in, in being in the arena and taking the swing as such, but, um, you know, it was, and I know that now, so I don't get frustrated if I miss it so much because, you know, I can't, I can't expect that that's going to happen each time. 15 minutes before an FMC meeting where power's on a talk, you know, like it's, that's unrealistic. So um, yeah, you don't get so caught up in your big wins. You just, you, you're grateful for them, but then you just got to minimize your losses, don't you? And not let them get out of control. So, cause you don't control the outcome. That's another thing I have been is it's called baseball memory. Um, it's a long, long season, 162 games. So you can't you can't be standing up there looking at the next pitch thinking, wow, two weeks ago in Arizona, I hit that one so hard it it never came down. You know, you just can't do that. You have to remember that you're gonna swing at the same pitch, but you have to forget the outcome of it because the outcome it's just going to cloud your now you you, you, you yeah. can't let you can't let the fear of missing and swinging out or hitting a line drive into the shortstop yeah. which we've all done a hundred times yeah you got to be used to, to to uh getting out seven times out of ten too even the best ones it's seven yeah. times out of ten they're not succeeding and i think we can my, better that mind, but... to go further yeah, yeah malcolm we can we can beat seven out of ten <laughs> <Come on. laughs> We could get you to 50 50 at least. I, yeah, I know. Just shut your eyes and click, right? Enough, enough <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Like, we'll through skill, 50 50 is very doable. Like, yeah. Really oh, yeah. right. for sure. A friend of mine says it's a round bat and a round ball. Anything can happen. Yeah. Well, the difference between a home run and a fielder taking it at the inside track is less than a 16th of an inch on the bat. I mean, the guy hits it's the same. You know, Judd get up there, he hits and swings the same. Whether or not it clears the fence or not is whether or not it was one sixteenth of a difference on the location of the bat. So that's that's why they call it a losing game. Baseball, it's it's a game of losses. Right. I well, think trading's like that too. Like it's it's not. It, well, you do have, as as uh, Charles pointed out, you do have to check yourself if you get on a streak of wins not to get too cocky about it too but but for me it's it's learning the, the loss learning the losing being a good loser yeah being a better loser is um is something that we're i think we're we're touching on the edge of a little bit is i look i follow the nba but i don't really know anything of baseball but i understand the sport as such but um are these guys that are batting at a, it's called RBI, that like a higher average batting, I don't know what it is, but anyway, if the really good ones are almost black swans in a sense, and we don't want to base our lives thinking that we're going to be that person, because obviously it's very, very hard to be, to be like that. Like I'm trying to work out the correlation between the two, where you don't want to release complete control of everything, because then you'll never get anywhere. Like if it's all just random luck, well, that's not true, but, um, I guess it's it's alluding to, to getting in the trade. What are we actually in control of? Um, yeah, I think they're talking more about the psychological than the literal. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like the yeah. like accepting the fact that it's that you could do everything right, you could swing the bat perfectly, and that fucker could still go foul. You know what I mean? Like it's just well, yeah. I got I got a trade on right now in Costco. I'm long Costco. And I added to it today because of the action it was doing before the FM1C. So I added to it today. I got 10 points out of it. Well, it's a it's a spread. So it's option spread. So, you know, that was 
nice sweet 150 bucks let it run i got i got time let this puppy run well after the close they announced their um quarterly sales not earnings this, 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 this is what we sold in gas last month and the month before well i had 10 points and 16 of them are gone in the overnight jesus that's a line drive that's a line drive right to the shortstop <laughs> so i'm gonna wake up tomorrow and my spread's going to be worth break even at best at best it's going to be you know it's, i was looking at maybe having three hundred dollars by friday and it's going to be i'm going to be lucky to get out break even by friday yeah. and that's it, just plain and simple is just luck i would say the only counter argument to that would be if you could have known they were going to release numbers mm -hmm. you could have said to yourself maybe i take profits now just in case the numbers are bad you know what yeah. i mean well, it, it definitely it definitely put a heads up to me that I didn't realize that that um, Costco did this. I knew that other companies did it, but I didn't realize Costco did this and they got earnings coming up in a week. So why would they do this announcement right before the earnings? I have no idea. Well, they, they do it so that the the price tanks now so that yeah. it's priced in when the earnings come out because mm -hmm. their bonuses are are calculated based on you know the stock price yeah, so, yeah. so they want to they want to deal with the worst of it now so that when the really bad news comes out next week you're it's not as bad you know? yeah it's you know it's going to shake out something who knows but those are the type of things when i say you, you, all you can really do is hit the ball and hope it lands where somebody ain't mm -hmm. yep. the inverse of that is what i alluded to a little bit before is it could have went the other way you could have made an extra 10 points overnight and then as, as that's dangerous as well because you're like oh that you know you didn't manage your risk as well as potentially you could have and, and it worked in your favor and then you're like oh that, you know then that's yeah. that's what I'm being so dangerous is mm -hmm. um yeah you, you, well, you could be a, a batter and close your eyes and swing the bat and get two home runs in a row and you think well that's the solution you know but that's just dumb luck like it's mm -hmm. probably not going to be a long-term strategy so mm -hmm. and that's well, I, had a, I had a set up in i had a set up in uh mastercard mm -hmm. same thing took a long call yesterday mastercard's up 13 points today mm -hmm. i closed that thing faster than hell at the end of the day today i was just like no i got you know you get 34 percent in one day it's pretty good you take it that's a gift mm -hmm. so i took it and it closed at the high of the day it kept going and closed at the high of the day no worries look for the next setup game tomorrow Always going to be a game tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I, mi I missed probably, well, Visa did the same thing. I was tracking it and I didn't take Visa. I took MasterCard. So I'm a swing trader. I, I don't trade. I day trade somewhat, but for the most part, it's swing trade options. And that's one of the reasons I love the read of the market uh, that we do in the pirate room, because mm -hmm. it gives me the general gist of when I can lean into the game and when I can lean out of the game. And that's what I use the uh, profile for and mm -hmm. basically the action of the market to tell me what my ball field's like today. You know, are the guys looking at their phones and trying to take the tarp out of the infield or are we, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sitting back, looking at the sunshine and eating hot dogs and ready for a, a game? Listen, Malcolm, we get it. You love baseball. Yeah. It. <laughs> it, it, I am in withdrawals. <laughs> get into I'm soccer. Watching, I've been watching Ken Burns again for like, my wife looked at me and she goes, haven't you seen this one? Yeah, it's number six. <laughs> it's like, it's too many times I've been watching that. That's funny. We don't do baseball in Australia. So don't move you do through. cricket, which don't even yeah. get me started on seven day long games. That oh, I love cricket. Nothing happens. Oh. Cricket is the greatest excuse in the world to day drink. I beg to differ. <laughs> you just sit there and get blind ass drunk watching these guys run around playing on the lawn. <laughs> All right, guys. Will anybody else get anything they wanted to add before we close this one up? I really um, appreciate this recommendation for this book. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, it was a good one. Yeah, I think um, I understand what you're saying moving forward around the, the prep and the work going in. I think moving into a couple like a digital 
meet up every two weeks sounds good to me because it's similar to what we're doing now anyway and it's nice to know you're not in it alone um, if we could still keep the book club running monthly as such where you do the vote and all that because i think it's going to help me and maybe other people in the group read books they might not lean towards and um and then i reckon within one of those fortnightly meetups, you could probably just say, oh, this, this is the agenda for this fortnightly. We might, for half of it, might talk about the book or whatever, you know what I mean? Which is still value add to people that haven't read it and value add to the ones that are. Maybe something like that could work. So you're saying do like regular meetups and just some of them are about the book each month? Well, like just a part of it, yeah. So you could say if you, have, if you meet up middle of the month, end of the month, because... I think the book's really good too, but we should also talk, see like the end of the month chat could be like about if people want to talk about their monthly P&Ls or how their win rates were or whatever as well. Like how did you trade this month? But within that hour session, you could do 20 minutes about the book too, you know, or, or who read the book or, you know, someone could present a couple of notes from it if they wanted or whatever. So it's not completely getting lost. There's still that accountability to finish it by that date, but, um, and still vote on it as such. But um if I'm the only one doing it, I guess I could read a book and, and talk about it anyway. So, oh, excuse me, I'm just gonna. Yeah, that's kind it. of where I'm at. Is like we, you know, we literally have had two people, two or three people show up two times. You know what I mean? Like it's like it, it's not a big enough turnout to justify the effort. Um. So yeah, let me think about it. We'll say not next month because it's Christmas and we're going to be busy, and then um, you know, we'll 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 figure it out in the new year. But like I said, I'm going to keep doing a book every month or every couple of months. But just instead of doing this lecture type of format, I'll just make a, a regular video that's more fun and entertaining and anyone can watch it. They don't have to read the book and they get the information, you know. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, get, I think the reality what you're seeing here is how many people are actually um, in the arena and trying to improve and and then you'll see the ones that end up being that 5%, you know, because there's a lot of people that don't want to do the work. So, Well, you know, what would really blow your mind is finding out the stats of how many people buy my e-course and don't even do it to the end. Hmm. It would blow your mind. Half the people don't even ever finish it. Hmm. It's like, I don't understand the way people, they don't want to do the work. Hmm. That's how good it is. You only have to do half of it and you know everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it's good. Like, it's not an ego thing. Like, I know no, that, no. that people that watch it to the end are really getting a lot of value from it. It's just funny to me how many people will pay for a course mm -hmm. and never finish it. And mm -hmm. it's like, what was even the point of this? You know, I'm, I'm guilty. And sometimes, like, I remember one of Tony Robbins' books, Money what is it money matters or one of his books and um i mean i got halfway through and he was clearly like stop the book go back write write down your notes you know and then come back and i never got back never did the note. never read the second half it's probably exactly what i need to be uh, you know in the bahamas right now but yeah i was about to say you would be running 400 companies if you'd have just done the workbook i know i know that's right <laughs> but i do I, on the flip side of that i saw a good a good meme the other day or, or quote it was basically like you read a hundred books and then one, one of those books changed your life forever. And it's like mm. the half glass full is like you read a hundred books to find one, but if you can find that one that changes your life forever, it's worth reading the hundred. So mm -hmm. I think that's where we're at. You just got to keep, and maybe this is the book. Mm. Well, there yeah, you go. I'm looking, for the, I'm looking for the three trades out of three trade setups out of 10. That'll, that'll work that well for me. Yeah. I, not having 10 losers in a row would be good. So. Oh. mostly it's just chilling myself out and not not getting all worked up just taking the ones i already know how to do just doing it simple keeping it simple suck less yeah suck less, suck less. <laughs> it sums it up doesn't it <laughs> to kind of add a little bit to what go ahead i was gonna say to add a little bit of what ben was saying you know read 100 books uh, that kind of resonates with me ben because uh you know, one book that I've read like five years ago that I continuously read is uh, One Good Trade by Mike Belfiore. If you guys haven't had an opportunity to read that, I definitely encourage you to. Uh, I believe he runs S&B Capital. And the biggest takeaway that changed my trading career was the fact that he mentions having a playbook. 
and having your trades that work best for you in a playbook and have a, a statistical report card on what works best out of that playbook and you can rely on. And it's something that I kind of, uh, you know, have myself and created. And uh, until I came across Charles, you know, I was trying to figure out how can I utilize market profile and uh, something that I added to my playbook based on market profile. And I want to thank you for this, Charles, is the poor high, poor low. When you see that, I mean, that's a guaranteed trade to make, make you money. You just wait for it to pull back, wait for resistance, go short or go long and just take your profits. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right, guys. Well, with that, we'll call it a uh, call it a day here. I cool. appreciate you all showing up. Uh, like I said, if if anybody wants to take over and do this part of it, I'm happy to keep the book club going. Um, but either way, we'll have lots of these chats in the future and um, lots of more meetups. So should be good. Good deal. Thanks, guys. All right. See y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Charles.